It's a difficult day and age to pastor a church and, and um, we need strength in the Lord to be able to do His will and, and I've just found a new lease, um, a new skip in my step to be able to, to, to fulfill the call of God on my life and, and serve the people that He's put into my care. And uh, this, this new intimacy that I have found has been so powerful to be able to, to give me that um, incentive and, and encouragement and joy that I needed to be able to do that. I've been trying to find out biblically, just simply exegetically, is the principles that I've been fussing with, do they hold up exegetically. In other words, do I, can I follow this right on through without forcing anything or making it fit or try to, uh, uh, you know, how you, you want to do, get it close as you can, use quarter inch paint, you know. And, uh, and I, I didn't want to do that in any way. And so I, I began to, to fuss around in the New Testament and look at this thing and pretty carefully. And so we're going to look at three, actually four, if we have time, four models of how Jesus has designed the, de the, the giants to be defeated. Now, I don't think I'm forcing anything. This is the first time I've taught it this way. And so I'm looking for some reactions from you and how this will, will, will come down. The first one, first of all, let's look at the, the seven giants. We've, we've, we've identified them. What will I do to look good? We asked you the other night. What will I do to look good? <laughs> whatever it takes. When it comes time, I found myself creating excuses and making lies and doing stuff in order that you wouldn't get to know what, the, what was really going on uh, in the basement of this soul. And uh, I found myself looking good. Watch the second one. Feel good. Third one, be right. Now, I, I've never had any problems with that, <laughs> and I know most of you haven't, but, but when it comes time to be right, now yielding that, in other words, recognizing the giant when it comes, not later, but recognizing when it appears on the, cer on the scene and dealing with it is one challenging kind of an experience, all right? Stay in control, uh, personal advantage, the hidden agenda and uh, and the uh, and and being undisturbed all right now what i did was i went back to the sermon on the mount and uh, and i looked at something that jesus was doing now watch what i want to do with this if i can and we'll talk about it jesus appears on the scene jesus is what agape personified now, if you read, if, sometime I would encourage you to do this, is sit down and just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John without stopping. All right? Just sit down and read the four Gospels without stopping. What you find is an amazing uh, four-sided picture of the person of Jesus Christ. Now, he comes on the scene, Agape comes on the scene, and he says... Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. All right? Now, this is the issue, the kingdom of God. That's the issue. How many know you do not have to um, mourn in order to be a Christian? In fact, it's fun. <laughs> All right? Now, what happens is, if we really come down to something, Jesus is talking about something that happens to people after they become a Christian. All right? Now, let's see if what, if, if, if what we're dealing with. Now, I can't open for you the whole Sermon on the Mount tonight. That's not my desire. But I'm back there now after about... Oh, it's almost 20 years. I wrote a book on the Sermon on the Mount called The King and You. 
And I wrote it and I knew I understood it. <laughs> and now I, I, I come back to this after several years later I'm back to this thing and the Lord said to me you should climb another mountain and I begin to perceive what it was the Lord was doing now let's look at Jesus introduction to the kingdom of God he takes these men up on the side of the mountain and men and women and he begins to say to them uh, blessed are the poor in spirit right now watch what he's doing with it. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek or gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those that are merciful. Blessed are those that are pure in heart. Blessed are those who are peacemakers, for they shall get their eyes scratched out. Blessed are those who are what? Right. Now, does anybody see straight up? Now, I, I, again, please, I, I understand I'm reaching for this as much as, as trying to teach it to you. How many of you know that it's tough to be poor in spirit and look good at the same time? I have to choose between those, don't I? I'm forced to some, somehow, Jesus is forcing an issue into picture, and what scares me is that we have taken Jesus' salvation and left his teaching. I think the church essentially is ignorant about what Jesus actually taught. Because all we wanted was what? This is what we wanted right here. And don't fuss with anything else. I'll see you in heaven. I'm not trying to be mean or cruel. I'm just trying to say something that, that, that if it's shocking, it's okay. But listen, this is an eros factor right here. I do not want to go to hell. Okay. Now, it is very difficult to look good and be poor in spirit at the same time. Now let's see if these follow. Let's what? Let's let's follow these down. Uh, if I'm forcing any of them, please help me. Feel good. What's the answer to that, or the antidote to it? Mourning. Now, I read a book about. Uh, Lord, help me to do this and do it properly. I read a book on why people are so much in pain. Why Christians are so much in pain. Scared the bejeebers out of me. The book says we have lost the ability to mourn. We don't know how to mourn. In fact, in many places, you're not even allowed to mourn. What's the matter with you? Don't you have faith? God is wonderful. The Lord is great. What you need to do is wise up and God will take care of it. But learning how to mourn is a skill. It's said of Mrs. Wesley that she gave her children five minutes to mourn. But the interesting thing, there was a limit to it. But how do I mourn? How do I actually learn to grieve? Because if I can grieve, I can identify with the thing, and in the grief, in the mourning, I can touch the reality of it, and the giant dies. The whole thing of learning how to, to feel good. Third one, to be right. And he says, no, the answer is not to be right, but to be what? To be meek. Learn how to be gentle, not right gentle. Now this is a this is a topsy-turvy kingdom he's introducing here. Number four, to stay in control. He said the answer to staying in, the, in control is hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now watch what I want to do with that. That I understand is what he said again in, 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 um, in um, uh, Matthew 6.33. 
Seek first what? The kingdom and all the rest shall be added to you. So if you want to know something about control, you do it God's way. Number four. Uh, number five, sorry. Uh, personal advantage. Rather than personal advantage, I'm learning how to be merciful. And I'm giving mercy in order to receive mercy. The hidden agenda. Remember this hidden agenda here? This hidden agenda? He said, the, the pure in heart shall what? See God. Now what I think he's saying is something very, very deep. He's saying something like this. If you have a hidden agenda, your eyes are clouded and you're not able to see the thing that I want. So this hidden agenda prevents the intimacy that I'm looking for. While I've got a hidden agenda, I find the whole thing is clouded. Not only my eyes are clouded, but my what? My ears are clouded. So I, I, if, I can, if I can find a pure in heart, the purity of heart. Uh, I remember a little song that we used to sing to the children. Be careful, little eyes, what you do. Do you remember that? Careful, little hands, what you do. Careful little tongue, what you say. Do you know what we were doing? We were putting the fear of God in those kids. See? And we were doing, we were doing something that was, was very pure and all. Last one, uh, undisturbed. The peacemaker and, uh, and the person who is being persecuted <laughs> finds himself very well disturbed, all right? And uh, you'll find, how many here have recognized all your adventure needs have been met since you became a, a, a serious Christian? <laughs> all your adventure needs. Let's go to the next one now and look if we can follow. Here's Philippians 2. Will you turn there in the scripture, please? And let me, let me fuss with us a little bit. Philippians now let's look. The Philippians church is a very wonderful church. Very few problems. No particular doctrinal problems. But uh, he begins by talking about uh, the reality, the spiritual reality in verse 2. Then he deals with the giants in verse 3 and 4. Now watch. Here are all the seven giants right here. All the seven giants do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Who is he speaking to? Christians. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but humility. Regard one another. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests. Isn't that a... Remember that from Philippians 2 the other, the other night? We have this attitude in yourselves. Now let's look at our notes here and see if we can follow. Now I'm not trying to make this happen. I'm trying to see if this happens. All right, looking good. He existed in the form of God feel good. He was obedient to the death on the cross. Be right. He emptied himself. I thought, my goodness sake. Stay in control. The equality with God, he didn't grasp or try to hold on to. He, he, he yielded something that I, every time I've attempted to do it, scared the bejeebers out of me. All right. He yielded something uh, that he called equality with God. Number five, personal advantage. Uh, he took on the form of a bondservant. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Number six, the hidden agenda. He was made in the likeness of men. Totally transparent. His whole life examined by, by everyone that, uh, that, that touched him and who, to whom he had ministered. Number seven, undisturbed. He hum humbled himself even to the death of the cross. So now, what, what, what Paul is saying is, if you're going to defeat the giants, you, you have a model that is agape, that is personified. That model will, if you will embrace it, it will deal with the giants. Now, I want to go through this one a little uh, faster because I don't want to dwell on it too long. But it's 1 Corinthians 13, the treatise on agape. Now, what I've done in my notes, and I, I've worked on this, is I picked up the 16 things that agape does. Again, I'm not, I'm not doing a Bible study. What I'm trying to do is show you how 
this thing works as far as the um, as a as agape and and eros works. Now notice. Well, let's just read down here. Patient, kind, not jealous. It doesn't brag. Is not arrogant. Is not unbelieving. Doesn't seek its own. Is not provoked. Doesn't take account the things suffered. Doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never, agape never fails. That's describing Bob Mumford. <laughs> Looking good, all right? Now, it, 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 how many of you know that 16 things are threatening? Um, does, does something happen to you like happens to me when I read that list I pull into myself and I don't want to hear it and it's like seeing starving kids on the television I uh, <laughs> change the channel why why I don't want to feel bad I won't be able to preserve the integrity of my eros comfort zone now what? When Paul started describing Eros, I mean describing uh, how, how agape worked, all he was doing was showing us how to defeat the seven giants. Of course, the seven giants, I have, I have tried there. Now, you, you may take exception to the way that I've applied them, but, but uh, patient. How many of you know you can't be patient and stay in control? Can you? You just can't be patient. I, coming here, I was in a long line. It was, it was about 5 o'clock traffic, 6 o'clock traffic. And, and, uh, and um, the person up there was like a left turn, and we sat through three lights while they were going down. And uh, I almost put my bumper on hers and pushed her around the corner. <laughs> For Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I found myself good. now not nearly as bad as it used to be. Not nearly. When I started, I get around the corner, and Judith's watching me, and I started to laugh. Now listen, one of the ways you can know the giant is dead is you stop talking to the other drivers. <laughs> Telling you some truth, you, you, because what that is, I, as a matter of fact, I do own the whole road. Right? Did you see the bumper sticker? As a matter of fact, I do own the road. Now what? Stay in control. Be right. Oh, they, there it is. There's a, a, a an eros mass right here. Nowhere does it reveal itself any more violently than in driving. Who does he think he is cutting in front of me? <laughs> me, God. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's frightening to me. And, I, and now I'm starting to laugh and I'm starting to yield and I'm starting to say, God, let the giant die. Set your servant free. Allow me to walk off free. And I'm getting there. Man, I'm telling you, I'm getting there. Let's look at the last one together. You, you don't even need to turn anywhere. So I'll just write it at the bottom of your paper. I hope I can do this with integrity and honesty. It's John 13 and the foot washing. I don't know how many times I've ever preached the foot washing. I can preach it powerfully. I can preach it with expertise. I can preach it with biblical accuracy. But now I want to live it. Somehow, God's got to help me. We're gathered in the, in the room. The man who washed the feet was the lowest of the household slaves. He was the grunt. Right, worse than the grunt. He was the nobody, the one that washed the feet. Jesus takes
this identity of girds himself with the apron and the disciples almost went crazy as he girded himself with this with the servant's apron I, I, I was reading this and I thought God I see what you're asking from me I see what you're asking from all of us you can't be the greatest then he says to them something like this you don't even know what I'm doing to you right now understand you don't even know what I'm doing to you. Peter said, you're not washing me. I'm not me. Not me. And he said, if I don't wash you, you have no part, no lot, no inheritance. He said, wash me all over. Bob Mumford personified. Always swimming one way or the other. Then he says, Master, wash my feet. And then, He's there with the basin to wash them. How many of you know that it's very possible to turn foot washing into a, an eros factor? It can be a religious, sickening, gross kind of a thing. And I'm not trying to make all kind of application. I just want you to feel something. So here he is. You can't look good with the... With the with the, with the apron on. You just can't. It, 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 it contaminates your French cut. <laughs> it really does. But you, you can't look good with that. And then he gets down, washes them all, including Judas. And then I said, Master, I want to follow you. I want you to help us. I'm not trying to change the whole world, but I am trying to change those of you that can hear me. If you're listening by audio, videotape, I appeal to you in Jesus' name. Don't just, I'm not lecturing you. I'm trying to appeal to something in us. Mother Teresa is going one way. Those deep, wrinkled eyes She's out there with the poorest of the poor. One man she pulled in had literally had worms crawling on him, all worms crawling on him. I shuddered and I thought, my God, it's agape incarnate. And I'm saying, Jesus, you've got to do something for us. I don't know how he will do it for all of us, or each of us, or individually, but I know he will do it if we can hear it. It starts by setting our love on him and agape filling the center of our being, forcing every one of these giants out to the periphery until God becomes the one who who guides and leads, motivates, the ultimate word is control. I want to be able to sit at the traffic light peacefully. I'm not there. But if you give me another year, I believe by God's grace I can get there. I really do. When you consider unshared love and the things that Bob Mumford has taught us concerning the various faces of love, the various types of love, I have found myself on a daily basis questioning my motives for the various things that I do. You will find in this teaching that three types of love are identified. One is eros, and one is agape, and one is pneumos. And the question we must each ask ourselves, and the question I find myself 
asking each day more and more is what is motivating me at this moment as I do or do not do a particular thing. Am I motivated by Eros? Am I motivated by Agape? Or am I motivated by Numos? And hopefully, as time goes on, I'll be motivated more and more by Agape. I find myself today motivated by Eros so often that I'm trying to learn to allow the Lord to move Agape love into me so that it will fill me and force out the heroes which is there. Let us pray. God our Father, Jesus Christ our Lord, Holy Spirit sent from the Father and the Son, come to us tonight as we try to put these concepts together. Lord, we seek to know you. We don't want to control you or own you. We just want to know you. Will you come tonight and reveal yourself to us and open to us a, a realm and experience of intimacy with you. It's something our heart aches for. But we're almost afraid to believe that it could be possible. Take this teacher and these people and the, and the video and the audio and, and bring us together with yourself for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 All right, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Jude, please. Now we're going to move along. Uh, like I said, uh, we're just going to move along and we have some wonderful thing uh, to, to, to talk about here tonight, but I want to very quickly re uh, review for us a little bit to uh, uh, put this back into a focus of, and then try to show you where we want to go with this. Jude is a book that deals with Eros and Agape very, very powerfully. And, uh, and uh, I would love to do more ab about this, but, but sometime, maybe tonight before you go to sleep, uh, just sit down and read the book of Jude and uh, get some idea of what, what is happening. But let's go over to, uh, to uh, verse uh, 18, all right? 18, 19, 20, 21, just very quickly. And... Um, we want to look at these, at these verses. Look at the Jude 18. They were saying to you in the last time, there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. This is the era of shift that happened at the fall of Jerusalem. It's happened at the fall of Rome. When I describe for you the era of shift, I think that every civilization could be identified in that way. All right, following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. Um, verse 20, but you, now he's speaking to us, the serious Christian, but you, beloved, three things. One, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. That is, understand the content of the gospel and the New Testament. That has to do with content. We have to build ourselves up on the most holy faith. Number two, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, as a charismatic, I could do a lot with that, all right? <laughs> but, uh, but praying with fervency, the Holy Spirit, it's not a, a, a kind of prayer that is, that is rote, but it has to do with, a, with an intensity. Now, the third thing, watch the third thing. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, what I want to try to show you, and I'm going to do it very quickly, keep yourselves in the love of God is a biblical admonition. All right? Now, last night we talked about Matthew 24, 12 that said, because lawlessness shall abound, what happens? Come on. The love of many shall grow cold. Now, with that, very simply, is this. Now, listen carefully. I wish, like I would, I wish I had time to just nurse this with us together, but I can't do it. Listen, you lost your first love. That's not what it says. It says you left it. Now, if we left it, we can go back and get it. Because it's not lost. We know where we left it. 
Now, the, the accusation, Revelation 2, 4, said, you left your first love. Now, very simply, this is what I'm fussing with. How do we go back and recapture our first love, the love, when, when I first met the Lord, the grass was green, the sky was beautiful, and I could hug a tree, you know? Well, you, you remember the, the joy of that initial encounter with the Lord was so intense. But no, I, I wanted to preserve that. Now, I'm 40 years in the Lord, and I wanted to preserve that. Now, what does it mean, keep yourselves in the love of God? Now, in a little while, I'm going to talk to you about the concept in John 15 of abiding abiding now I know we, we think we understand abiding but I think you're going to see in a few moments that unshared love and keeping ourselves in the love of God and abiding are, 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 are uh, synonymous terms and then they'll come to it now if I lose or left if I left my first love, what happens is, even as a Christian, my eros begins to take the center of my being. Question, is there such a thing as a selfish believer? You can't deny this. This is reality. And, and I, 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 I know that by experience. <laughs> it has nothing to do with theory. It has to do with, with the reality. Now, uh, if, if, if Eros is the center of my person, then agape is pushed out to the periphery of my person, and I am living my life, and, and my testimony goes something like this. I have one desire, make heaven my home. Home. And it worries me because I think when a Christian like that gets there, they're going to rip off the golden curbs, you know. It, 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 it makes me really nervous because there's, a, there's an eros, there's a selfishness that has come. It is called an eros shift. Now that error shift means that I have, I have missed my first love and I have moved into a sphere, a realm, a way of living my life that God doesn't want us to live there. Now an, an agape conversion means I see which way my life is going and I want to turn that thing back and I want to move in it. Now my illustration, which I was hoping would be clear to you, was the difference between Mother Teresa's wrinkled eyes and Elizabeth Taylor's painted ones. Elizabeth Taylor is going one way. She is moving in an eros dimension. I'm not trying to judge whether she's Christian or not a Christian or not. I'm not doing it. All I'm saying is the direction of her life on the eighth husband tells me where she's going. Now she paints herself to be beautiful and I understand that. And now we have another totally different personality. Her name is Mother Teresa and here's a woman who has, who has given herself in such a manner that it almost threatens us to be around her, to be with her. At the National Prayer Breakfast, the President's Prayer Breakfast, she got, had to stand up on a stool to talk, and she talked about what abortion is doing in America and confronted the whole nation, this little half pint, all right? And, 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 and the power and the presence of God came, and the place gave her a standing ovation. They did not know what to do with her. The reason is, this is agape has come to us. All right. Now, think with me for a moment, because I, I, I need to move this as, as quickly as I can. 2 Corinthians 5.14 from last night says these words. The love, the agape of Christ controls me. This is a controlling factor in my life. Agape then becomes a governing factor in my life. It is the thing that allows me to do what God is asking me to do. Now you'll see the reason why that's important in just a moment as we get to this thing we're talking about the agape road. Now, I want you, I want you uh, serious attention and I want to show you something again not, not accusing anybody but look listen carefully what I'm saying has eros affected the medical profession now why 
For years, very few people know that hospitals and nursing and all that was essentially born out of the church because it's a caring thing. Most doctors, most nurses, there are several nurses here that I know, RNs, and, 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 and I, I was in the medical, I wanted to be a surgeon uh, very badly, and uh, that's what I, I really wanted to do, and I had opportunity to do it. And the Lord said, I called you to be a soul doctor, all right? So the implications of what? Wow, now watch, in medicine, something has happened. For many years, medicine was motivated by agape. It was a calling. I did it for God. It was something that was in me because I, I, I cared. How many know you can't pay people to care? And so the medical profession very slowly but very determinedly is turning from, from a caring profession. Not all of them. Please don't, this is not a blanket accusation. Not all of them, but many of them until you're treated like a piece of meat. Then we have elderly crisis, ho uh, nursing crisis, home care crisis, and all that thing. Now, I think, uh, uh, so, so, so medicine becomes... A, now, is it any surprise that abortion is now a, a, a national disgrace? Because what happens is, as eros shift, then children are a bother. Right? The more I move into a selfish kind of a, a, of a lifestyle, then children... How, how many here know children are difficult? I mean, they, they cost you. You have to lay your life down. I mean, you really do lay your life down for children. Now, now, now follow what I want to say, because what I'm trying to help you to see is the implications of what I've taught you this far. Let's look at the next one, school teachers. All my life, school teacher was absolutely a calling. It was a caring profession. It was something where he or she laid her life down. Every once in a while you see one in the classroom who is, who is an agape type of a personality who is loving their students. But that is very quickly shifting. There's a narrow shift in the whole school system. And is there an effect of that? Now we're into an educational crisis, and, and I, I don't know how that will sort out. Third one, policemen. I don't even need to say anything more about that. Almost every film now shows you how the policeman, or the, the mayor, or the, 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 the police is, is part of the drug scandal. So, so one film after another is showing us how the whole thing has shifted now. And we're now we're beginning to see what the implication. One more illustration. The ministry. I have no accusations against my brothers and fellow ministers and others. I'm just saying that from a calling, it becomes a profession. Quick illustration. Pastor in England a little church outside of London and he gets a call to go to a bigger church and, uh, and they're packing their stuff and as they're putting it on the wagon, they're packing their stuff on the wagon, she's crying tears are running down her face and finally she, he says why are we doing this? And she says, I don't know. He said, because it's a bigger church and it's more successful and we're, we're moving. And she said, but I don't want a bigger church and I don't want to be successful. I want to be with these people. These are the people that I love. And so he says, let's get all the stuff off the wagon. <laughs> Bring it all back in, put it in. Like the church in London says, no thanks, we don't want it. And then right after that, the week following, he wrote the song, Blessed Be the Tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Now we're talking about integrity, we're talking about agape, we're talking about people that love and are bound to one another, and success is not, unshared love doesn't bow to success. It, 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 it bows only to the will of God. Now, when agape, when eros, when eros is mature, it produces three kinds of people. This will come to maturity. Three kinds of people. Entitlement. That sounds familiar? 
third one is a predator I mean a predator is a man or woman who is out for anything he or she can get third one of course is a parasite it took me a long time to realize that there are parasites in the body of Christ but there are now entitlement is a frightening thing I was teaching this in Oklahoma a lady came to me visibly shaken she said I have been in welfare and I have been in a caring profession for 17 years she said in the last few in the last two three years something has happened in the realm of welfare that deeply worries me I said what is it she said people will lie falsify the documents they will cheat they will do anything to get what's entitled to them now when that happened in Rome it was over that was the fall of the Roman Empire now entitlement right now is absolutely broken loose if I ask you one reason for the national debt what is it entitlement if I, I'm not being overly simplistic I'm telling you that entitlement is now about to push us as a nation into a crisis of some kind now when agape is mature now let me talk a moment about a predator I learned about a predator when I was at, at, um, at the San Quentin a predator is a very violent type of a person they will do anything say anything to acquire to do to force their own will in prison it's a very ugly um, very very ugly thing now do we have predators in medicine do we have predators in the education academic world do we have predators in as policemen that, that's what all the fuss is about all right? do we have predators in the ministry Right? And I could name several other caring professions. All I want you to do is see the picture. Now, uh, when agape is mature, when agape is mature, we become agape does, does mature. We have to grow in love. This is 1 John 4, I think it's verse 12. Don't hold me to that, I'm just guessing. He said agape can be perfected or it can come to a full oak tree. When that happens, we are able to follow Jesus. I won't write this up here. We're able to follow Jesus and we become a life source for others. We find ourselves always reaching, always finding opportunity to give life and help to others.